Hello. Special thanks to Own a Saber for sponsoring a 90,000 subscriber lightsaber giveaway. All the details in the pinned comment down below. Our story begins on Mustafar shortly after the execution of Order 66 and the droid shutdown code that authorized the shutdown of all CIS foundries and factories. Geyser Delso, a Genosian engineer from the era of the Clone Wars, arrived at the fiery world that was controlled by the Confederacy. Geyser was here because he knew that the leader of the Genosian operations, Paco the Lesser, would be here. His intention was to understand why the shutdown code was sent out across the droid army. Delso was one of the key designers of the All Shutdown Command, and without a reason for the shutdown, he wanted to know why the CIS leadership was shutting everything down. As he arrived at the Mustafar platforms, he noticed that something was eerily different about the whole foundry. He floated into the building and noticed that the walls were scarred, and then he saw it. He opened the doors and saw the entire Separatist Council gutted on the floors. This was certainly troublesome, but Geyser was smart enough to look through the hollow recordings inside the room. Not that he would ever know who did this, Geyser immediately noticed that the control panels for the structure were destroyed, which meant the entire foundry could slip into the lava river at any moment. Geyser quickly went to the control panel and instructed it to take every moment recorded in the last 48 hours and then put it into a small chip for him. He turned around and searched for Poggle the Lesser. Chances are Poggle hadn't survived, but if he did, then he could be a useful ally. Geyser quickly got to work scouring the entire facility interior. He was surprised to find Watt Tomber of the Techno Union also dead. Geyser didn't know much, but he was aware that members of the Techno Union and Trade Federation had control drives which allowed them to take full control over the facilities and foundries whenever they wanted. It was a security switch that they had created to ensure the droids didn't rebel against them. The Trade Federation redid a couple designs after their failure at Naboo anyways. Newt Gunray and the other couple of leaders of the Trade Federation had these drives in their pockets, and considering they were all here, Geyser took advantage of their slaughter. He went to everybody and took the drives that he found. His disenchantment with the Republic or the Jedi only fueled him. Two invasions of his home world and a Republic occupation was enough to drive someone mental. Geyser was getting to the point where he refused to serve any master other than himself and he didn't even know who was responsible for all this destruction. Geyser, unlike the Separatist Council, was unaware that the Separatists had a massive supply of droids held in reserve. This was there because Sidious wanted to be sure that if he couldn't conquer the Republic with politics, then he'd have a guarantee of victory in other means. If he couldn't take the power of Emperor himself, at least the Jedi'd be dead, and he could just change teams, only to overpower the Republic and become Emperor. It didn't matter who died, as long as he got what he wanted in the end. Geyser continued to pull drives off of all the bodies, and then he got to Pogba the Lesser. Despite a clone occupation on Genosis, they had secretly been building Separatist battle droids for the longer part of the last two years. It wasn't easy, but the clones never fully controlled Genosis anyways. Geyser also knew that with Genosis being the primary facility for the droid manufacturing in the galaxy, he would have to change locations. His engineering mind may have not been built for battle strategy, but it was built for big brain activity. Geyser heard the chip pop out of the console on the other side of the room, and he floated over and grabbed it. Before he left, he made sure he took everything he could from the various dead bodies around the room and left. Shortly after he left, the entire facility crashed down to the Lava River. Inside the CIS shuttle, Geyser returned to the last known fleet position in the Outer Rim at Hypori. As he was in hyperspace, Geyser looked over all the security recordings and noticed that something was off. The Separatist Council came here waiting for someone to protect them, from the end of the war. He then saw a hooded figure appear of a hologram before another one shortly after came in and slaughtered them. Geyser was wise enough to see that there was a distinguishable difference between both hooded figures. Geyser then thought of something as he looked at the most recent briefing from the Galactic Senate on Coruscant. He watched as a man rose from the floor and he wore a hood as well. Geyser was outraged but he listened and the voice matched up from the voice in the hollow recording inside the facilities of Mustafar. His mind was broken. How could it be possible? How could the Emperor be behind both sides? And then it clicked even further. The Clone Wars were a proxy war to set up a power-hungry individual with the loyalty and confidence to become a dictator over a fractured galaxy. Geyser became furious. All of his life's work was to benefit not himself or the people of his planet, but an evil man from Naboo. Geyser's rage sat in his chest as he exited from hyperspace and saw a Separatist fleet sitting dead in space. The entire fleet had been shot down, and it was a massive fleet, one of the last remaining heavy-hitting fleets in the galaxy. Geyser flew his ship into the open hangar bays and quickly made his way to the command bridge. Luckily, the life support systems on the ship were still operable, but it was freezing inside the ship. The capital ship had an access panel that could reignite the flame. Thanks to the destruction of the Mustafar facilities, Geyser couldn't turn the droid armies back on. The literal only thing that worked inside the room was the security recording software. Geyser, while not being a battle tactician or a politician like Pago the Lesser, knew that he wouldn't be able to expose Palpatine's plot politically. 
The only thing he could do is expose the Republic's weaknesses. The Separatist plot had to move in secrecy for as long as it could. not They had to rise up against this new empire. He couldn't win the political battle. As a Genosian, he'd be seen as an agitator. Palpatine already did a brilliant job at throwing the Jedi under the bus for a war that he started. He could do it to a Genosian as well, and Geyser didn't want his people to suffer anymore. He plugged the drive into the vessel and watched it return to life. The droids all powered back on, the lights flickered back on as well. The super tactical droid in charge of the fleet turned over and looked at Geyser and requested his identification code. Geyser plugged his in, but it wasn't really his. He plugged in the code for Paco the Lesser. He may have not looked like him, but it didn't matter. To a droid, the code is all that mattered. It bypassed their security. Geyser identified himself as Poggle, but told the super tactical droid to call him Geyser. The droid listened and asked what his request was. He told the droid everything and then showed proof of their great betrayal. The super tactical droid ran through a million different scenarios within moments and came to the conclusion that despite the size and the reserves Geyser showed him, the Separatists had about a 68 out of 139,891 chances to obtain victory against the Empire. He said that most of these victories would be obtained through pure military force and the hope that the Imperial officers were dumber than those who fought for the Republic. Though the tactical droid believed that the Republic officers would be no different being that not much time passed in between. Geyser told the super tactical droid that they needed to regroup all their forces in one location and prepare to bunker down. They needed to obtain a means of consistent revenge on the Republic, or as they now called it, Empire. The super tactical droid pulled up a hollow map of every droid foundry in the galaxy and told Geyser that if the Emperor was in full control of the Empire, then every single foundry would be targeted. He also suggested that every previously shut down fleet would be too. As a means to keep their numbers hidden, he suggested they relocate. Geyser agreed, and asked where they should go. The super tactical droid told Geyser that they would go to Skako Minor for a brief stint, probably around four rotations. As Geyser explained that he was the last of the Separatist Council, and that he had all the data chips necessary to control the Trade Federation Techno Union, and just about everything else, this confirmed the tactical droid's plan. He found this to be great, and then decided that a new factory would be necessary for the growth of the Resistance. The droid pulled up a star map and decided on Bakura. The Genosha never heard of the planet, but it was on the far side of the galaxy, out past the Endor system. It was basically uncharted territory, and aside from a local small population, it'd be the perfect place to regroup. The tactical droid issued out a command order to send the fleet to Genosius, while the rest of the Separatist forces moved to Skako Minor. The entire plan was to pick up any and every droid foundry they could relocate and then move it to a different part of the galaxy. They could overwhelm the enemy if they built up over time. While the tactical droid was doing this, Geyser set up his own plan of revenge and dispatched a small fleet of Trident-class assault ships to Naboo. Geyser had no reason to believe that Palpatine was a Sith Lord, or even know what that was, and so he's going to make sure the people of Naboo suffered. Afterwards, it was everyone against the Empire. As they were making their preparations, a Republic fleet dropped out of hyperspace. It wasn't large by any means, just three Venators, and orders to destroy a fleet dead in the water. The super tactical droid noticed immediately, but then he realized that the fleet had no clue the Separatist fleet was operational. They were closing in distance. The only reason they didn't know was because the shields weren't up and the fleet was not maintaining typical movements for Separatist vessels. It was mostly because the tactical droid was preoccupied at the moment. He issued out orders to wait for the Republic to close in, which is what they were doing. The tactical droid ran through millions of battle plans and diagnosed that the Republic was simply here to destroy the fleet and move on to the others. It was essentially a target practice for the clones. They got to enjoy destroying the droids as the spoils of war, and their enslavement of course. As the Republic fleet moved in, their bay doors opened and the super tactical droid ignited the shields on the fleet and the Republic was sent into utter chaos. Geyser and the super tactical droid next to him watched as the Republic fleet was glassed. The clones had nothing to defend themselves with but the bodies of their brothers. Fire exploded over the bridge of the flagship, and the light bounced off of Geyser's eyes as he watched with pure joy as the Republic burned. It was only a matter of time until the rest of the Empire burned as well. With the fleet shredded, the Separatists relocated to Skako Minor. Across the galaxy, everything was going quite similarly. The Republic fleets and the clones had no clue that the Separatists had turned back on, and they walked into a number of traps. Thousands upon thousands of clones were slaughtered by the Separatist fleets. At the same time, a collection of fleets arrived outside Genosis and ripped apart the Republic forces. The clones had nothing against the droid forces, and from the surface, millions of battle droids and thousands of Genosians relocated to the fleet and launched into hyperspace towards Bakura. While there were rebellious groups in the galaxy, like Saw Gerrera, they were no match for the might of the Separatist military reinstated for war. As Geyser and a super tactical droid, otherwise known as Bit, continued to relocate their factories on Skakra Minor, his secondary plan was being put into action. 
The Republic presence on Naboo wasn't massive, and he had every intention of making sure Palpatine knew he was messing with the wrong people. While Sidious was being informed about the numerous losses in the Outer Rim, he didn't disclose any of it with the public. As far as both governments were concerned, the Republic won the war, and both the CIS and the Republic were replaced with the Empire. It was clear, that's as much as anyone need to know about it. On Naboo, the Trident-class assault ships arrived into the seas of Naboo. The Gungans were blindsided by the Aqua droids as they pulverized the unprepared Gungan defenses. Their water walls were broken down as they tried to fight back, there was nothing they could do. The Aqua droids landed on their platforms, some of them still holding the water out, and others completely destroyed. The Gungans and their entire home was ripped to shreds. The few who were able to escape didn't have time to inform the Naboo of the incoming attack. The Separatist droids didn't go for the obvious attack. Just as they did on Kamino, they came from the water. The Trident Assault ships rose from the rivers in Thede, and then began blasting away the civilians. The few clones didn't have time to prepare. The Trident slammed down onto the few military locations in the city and dropped their aqua droids down onto the clones. The droids ripped through the few clones, and before the Naboo could defend themselves, their hangar bay was also taken over. The aqua droids were merciless with the Gungans, and even more so with the Naboo. It was a massacre, and before the Empire could arrive, the Separatists had vanished. Though they didn't retreat from the planet, they waited for the clones to arrive and jump them again. This led to thousands more civilians being killed in the streets, and hundreds of clones who arrived to save the Nebu shredded as well. The Empire did eventually win the day, which was planned by Geyser, but it did come at a cost. Nearly the entire Gungan population was exterminated, and the Nebu were torn to pieces. Palpatine couldn't hide this one from the public, and so he had to return to his home world and commemorate the people who were slaughtered, only 13 years after the United again. Sidious was furious, and he told the people of the galaxy that despite this small uprising in Naboo, the Empire would focus its resources into structuring around a larger military. As it proved, the Empire wouldn't need clones, and as Sidious expertly handled the situation, he turned a net negative into an overwhelmingly positive resolve. The Imperial Stormtrooper was being sworn in to replace the clones, and the Imperial Star Destroyer would replace the Venator. Geyser and Bit weren't done yet. As they claimed home on Bakura, they had to silence a population of people. But considering the people of the planet were so far removed from the Clone Wars, they didn't care what happened as long as they didn't get targeted. Geyser ensured them that nothing bad would ever come to them. Bit sent out a number of commando squads to Republic shipyard planets, such as Corellia and Kuat. The point of this was to learn the schematics of the Imperial Star Destroyer. They had seen them showcased in front of the Empire and Coruscant, and he wanted to know everything about them. The Imperial One had been completed before the Clone Wars, but it was never used. It wasn't the most common ship to see, but Sidious clearly wanted to show how effective his new Empire was under his leadership. Bit and Geyser could see based off the size alone that the Imperial One would be much larger of a threat than any Venator could be. Though they did learn something about the Imperial One after about three commando squads went missing, and the fourth returned with all the information needed. To ensure that these commando units weren't seen to be operated for anyone in particular, Bit made sure they went out of their way into the galaxy and deployed groups of battle droids. This was to make it seem as if the shutdown command didn't work all the way on all the droids. The entire purpose was to make everything feel like it lacked calculation and direction, which for the most part worked. But Palpatine was wary of the massive fleet that could be building. He obviously had no reason to assume that the remnant of the CIS would be building factories, but he did know that the CIS still had a fleet in operation. Though, as is the nature of someone like Sidious, he had more important things to attend to, like belittling his apprentice. Sidious had advisors constantly looking into it, and with the promotion of Tarkin, he would take a hold of this mission to find this resistance. Bit knew the Empire would come looking for them, and so, instead of making the Empire chase them, he came up with a better idea. As the years trickled by, Bit and Geyser watched the Outer Rim grow with a new criminal empire named Crimson Dawn. The empire was controlled by Darth Maul, but the face of it was Dryden Voss. The Pike Syndicate, the Huts, and the Black Sun all had business with Crimson Dawn. But the super tactical droid realized that it could take advantage of this new threat in the galaxy. Being that Crimson Dawn was a pirate organization, he could gift them a number of weaker vessels in the Separatist fleet and then allow the Empire to track them down. This worked for a number of reasons, but the main reason being that the Empire would automatically assume that all the previous attacks were coming from Crimson Dawn rather than organized resistance. Though there was one thing that could ruin that. As Tarkin and his team realized the foundries on Skakro Minor, Genosis, and a couple other locations vanished, it was beginning to seem like there could be a plot, but again, Bit, being a super tactical droid, was prepared for this. There was a number of Genosian, Skakonian, and Nemodian allies that would be propped up as allies to Crimson Dawn. Bit and Geyser sent those allies as representatives to Genosis, Skakro Minor, and Keta Nemodia to assist the Crimson Dawn. 
Of course, to Dryden Voss, this was a big break Maul promised him. While Crimson Dawn's empire was making its name known around the galaxy and their product was seen all the way from the spice mines of Kessel to the lower levels of Coruscant, their hunger for aggressive expansion set the forefront of their minds. With three new allies, thousands of battle droids, and dozens of warships, Crimson Dawn was finally becoming an actual empire. It, on the other hand, was assisting Geyser with designs for new Separatist warships, so it was a win-win. The purpose of designing new warships was to perfectly counter the power of the Imperial Navy, which was considerably large. Though something as the years rolled by became increasingly apparent to Geyser, if he wanted to overthrow the Empire, he needed more than just power. As it became clear, there were minor rebellions across the galaxy. Nothing large, but they did exist. They tried to negotiate with Saul Guerrero, but that went terribly, and their commando squad was shredded. Not that Saul had much of a past for liking Separatist troops anyways. Geyser then set his sights on the Galactic Senate. Despite it being Imperial, there were a number of senators from the era of the Republic that hated Palpatine or actively stood against him. As Geyser suspected, there could be more that would stand against him at this current time. He would be right though. He would be surprised to learn that one of the senators was recently killed. While just about everyone in the Senate knew it was an assassination, the death of Senator Ryo Chuchi was swept under the rug as the Separatist movement against the Empire. Her death marked the beginning of Mon Mothma and Bail Organa's turn against the Empire completely. Chuchi was so young when she died, and they knew that they had to resist this evil force. Geyser knew he had to get a hold of them, though he did fear that they would be more against him than Palpatine, so he decided that meeting would take place in a neutral space. Geyser took the protocol droid and four commando droids and went to Mandalore to meet with Mothma and Organa. While the planet had seen much destruction after the rise of Crimson Dawn, Maul and his Mandalorian agitators were no longer in control. That control belonged to bo Katan Kryze and her true Mandalorians. She had enough order on the planet to be able to host this event. Mon and Bale expressed distaste for the use of battle droids against the Empire, simply because battle droids were temperamental and they had no regard for life. Geyser expressed that as an engineer, all he had to do was flip a switch, and the droids would become as docile as clone troopers. They wouldn't target civilians or any sentient life aside from troopers of the Empire. Mon was very against it. It was repulsive. To wage war against the Empire was suicide, but Bale liked the idea a lot. Bale suggested that at the moment, it wouldn't be feasible, but if they could continue to garner support, they could construct an alliance in the darkest times in recent galactic history. Mon was reluctant, but getting rid of the Empire with the Separatists was better than keeping the Empire with Palpatine. They wanted to see his facilities, but he refused to take them. This was something they were not a fan of, but because Geyser was adamant that he didn't want them being tracked at his location, they sort of understood where he was coming from. He told them that he would have a fleet large enough to combat the Empire in a number of years. Of course, being that the Empire continued to expand, they would always be behind the full might of the Empire, but they would pose a legitimate threat. Mon and Bale wanted to know where they were getting the supplies, and Geyser simply explained that they found everything they needed where they were located. It was true. Around Bakura were clusters of unnamed planets that hadn't been explored and were open for colonization. It wasn't much of a colonization process, but more or less, it was their territory now, where they had droid foundries and shipyards constantly at work. Because there were so many B-1 battle droids, many of them were reset with building and engineering specs, so they constantly were at work innovating and constructing Separatist supplies. As their meeting came to an end, they formed the beginning of the Rebel Alliance. It wasn't much, but it was something. With representatives from Genosa, Skako Minor, and Kata Nemodia joining this alliance, it was their first stand against the Empire, though there was legitimate concern for Bale and Mon. They had to figure out a way to make it seem as if they weren't trying to reinvent the CIS. The purpose of this rebellion was entirely to have a new face, one that wanted to restore order to the galaxy. If the public saw the Separatist flag, they would assume Mon and Bale were working as agitators for the former CIS. But Bale suggested that no matter what they did, Palpatine would paint them as negatively as possible. It's how he kept his power. With such a grip on the galaxy, they needed to take their time. Chances are, the Alliance wouldn't be ready until Leia was an adult. Mothma agreed. She knew that the day would come when their children would be old enough, and they would be whisked in action to save a galaxy that their parents lost. A number of years would go by without major interactions between the Empire and this resistance. The Crimson Dawn by this time would have his one only engagement against the Empire. The massive fleet they built with the assistance of Geyser was wiped off the face of the map. For Bit and the other several tactical droids, it was a means for them to study Imperial attack patterns, especially against Separatist warships. Due to them already having specs on the Imperial ones, the droids were getting ahead, which is why they began prioritizing fighter superiority. Geyser knew that they needed to call upon more sentient engineers. While the droids were fine on what they did, algorithmic construction wouldn't last forever, and he also knew that the Hyena Bomber wouldn't last forever. 
The droid starfighters were terrific. They were full of functional droids that could maneuver on their own, but he wanted another one. One that would be more efficient as a bomber. The hyenas and vultures were great cover, but he wanted a blockade buster, something that could rip through an Imperial Star Destroyer. Luckily, Geyser had a couple of contacts out around the galaxy, though one of them might not be as interested considering they were on separate sides during the Clone Wars. But he got a hold of Mon Calamari engineer, Quarry, and requested to meet with them. As Geyser learned, Quarry was willing to put their past feuds behind them, not that they really feuded to begin with. Considering Mon Cala only had an issue with the Corrin and the Separatist leader Count Dooku for backing them, there was no animosity between the two engineers. Corrin knew that Geyser couldn't stop Dooku even if he wanted to, so no harm, no foul. But he was in. He wanted to help develop a blockade buster for the beginning of this rebellion. Corrin joined Geyser in the Bakura sector and they began drawing up plans for what would become two different fighters of the same breed, both being ASF. O1 B-Wing fighters. The sleek design was similar on both of them. However, one of them was meant to be automated. The other one would be flown by a pilot. As Corey suggested, people would rise up if they had ships to fly. He didn't know much about the rest of the Alliance, but he did know people. As they built their B-Wing variants, the Alliance continued to grow, and in 5 BBY, the fire was lit on Ferrix, one that came after the shock on Aldani. A group of people inspired by the words of Marva Karassi Andor, her words spoke to the people of the galaxy. While not everyone could hear it due to the riot on Ferrix being shut down and the Empire slaughtering those they found in the rubble, the words uplifted those who were in fear. The notion of having been sleeping and allowing the Empire to roll in with their engines churning. The wound that couldn't heal at the center of the galaxy wouldn't be fixed. It was their evil darkness that was here. But not just on Ferrix, around the galaxy. She told the people that the Empire was a disease that thrived in darkness. One never more alive than it was when the people allowed it to thrive. The final words being, fight the Empire. Despite the Empire covering up the message, it was heard and people began to rally. And not only did they rally, but they fought. Geyser saw it. He could see the moment it was coming. A moment nearly two decades in the work was coming, and it was time. Because they had been sleeping. Not more than a year after the speech Marva gave a boy from the Thal spread a message. One to show how delusional the Empire tried making the Freedom Fighter seem. Ezra Bridger was his name, and his message was that people fighting against the Empire were not criminals. They were fighting for people, the ones stuck under the oppressive rule of the Empire. He asked the people if they wanted their lives to be their own, their families to be subjected to the rule of an evil regime. He admitted that it would only get worse unless they stood up. Reflecting what Marva said, there would be loss. Sure, it was easy to say that, but it was never easy to do it. They couldn't back down. He finished his message saying that they needed to stand up together because the people were strongest when they were, as one. The message spread like fire, and it stoked the flames of this new rebel alliance. And while only Hera knew about the larger rebel cell, she didn't know that Mon Mothma and Bel Organa had a means to fight the Empire in a head-on engagement. Geyser's fleet joined up with the alliance over Yavin, a fleet so large it made the one from the Battle of Coruscant look minuscule. The fleet divided up amongst the many moons and planets of the Yavin system. In the Separatist fleet were two new ships of the line. While the Providence for Cussant and Lucrehulk class ships couldn't be upgraded due to their superior designs, these new ships were amazing. While the Recussant regular was not a ship of the line, the one that Grievous used to helm was, and so they built off that design. His flagship prior to the use of the Invisible Hand was much larger and sturdier of a vessel. There were of course the Munificents, but they were a rarity in the fleet. The bulk of the Alliance fleet consisted of Goblin class destroyers and the Requiem class pincer cruiser. Each of them had their own benefits. The Goblin was very similar to the Recussant, which was intentional, though it was bulkier and sleeker, which was also intentional. It was a bit of an eyesore, meant to convince the Imperials they were dealing with a different ship. The Goblin was speedy but heavily armored. The Requiem pincers were much more heavy hitting. The design mirrored the Imperial 1s and Imperial 2s, but it wasn't nearly as big and its weapons were able to hit extremely well, and its shields were probably the best in the game which was thanks to Quarry and his knowledge of Mon Calamari vessels. The super tactical droids didn't have many interactions with the Alliance aside from the briefing Mon Mothma sent out about their mission statement. She was in firm disagreement with Saw Gerrera's actions and tactics and made it extremely clear that there would be none of that inside of this Alliance. The one thing that was difficult for tactical droids is that they were programmed for large warfare, yet the Alliance was scourging anything they could get a hold of for combat. Seeing this, Geyser and Bit decided that they should dispatch their droids with the Rebels, and it was agreed upon. There were spy missions being conducted by Cassian Andor, who was ascending through the Rebel ranks at the moment. On the other hand, the Grand Inquisitor was killed over Mustafar by Jedi Knight Kanan Jarrus. While he was unaware of the battle droids, when he found out, he was very disenchanted with the entire Rebel thing. 
Ezra didn't understand, but Hera told him about the war. While Hera had plenty of reasons to be disgusted with the use of battle droids, she understood it as a way to make their fight and take their fight back to the Empire, especially as the Empire is beginning to leave strong blockades around Lothal. Ezra was very adamant that they could try and get back to Lothal and free the planet. The crew agreed, but this time they were accompanied by the Alliance fleet. The size of this fleet inspired a Mon Calamari Admiral from Mon Calamari to join their ranks though Admiral Raddus wouldn't get to the fleet before the assault on the Thalm. One-sixth of the Alliance fleet dropped out of hyperspace with the Ghosts and a wing of X-Wings leading the assault. Ezra and Sabine were manning the cannons and Vader watched in horror as a massive fleet emerged from hyperspace. He hadn't seen so many droid ships since before Mustafar. He turned to the officer on deck and told him to scramble the fighters. The tactical droid, on the other hand, was working in tandem with Harris and Dula. She was to lead the fighter assault. As she pressed forward, dozens of Vulture droids dropped out of the Alliance capital ships. Behind them were unmanned viewings, which locked their S-foils into attack position as they rolled out of the hangar bays. Hera did a quick check-in to make sure everything was with her. The X-Wings quickly responded, and the droids did the same. Individual droids didn't. It was more or less a squad leader, if you could call it that. The ships blasted forward and TIE fighters bounced out of the Imperial vessels, preparing for their counter-attack. The X-Wings locked foils into attack position. The Imperial TIE fighter may have been decent, but the number of Ultra droids were overwhelming. They'd never seen a foe like this before. The heavy hitters launched their attack against the Imperial destroyers. It was difficult for the Imperial Navy. They weren't meant for defense, mostly offense. So seeing a large fleet like this only made their fears grow. Vader got to his personal ship and exited, trying to find his way, but all the support was vanishing. The Vulture droids cut through the TIE fighters and the B-Wings were given a clear path. Vader's ship was clipped. Without a solid back of a fighter, he was left alone. The B-Wings climbed up the side of the Star Destroyers, and all at once, the three Star Destroyers were left without shields. The Ghost rolled back around, and Hera told the X-Wings to break off. She would take on the leader. She followed Vader as fast as she could, as she saw smoke emanating from his ship. Ahsoka and Kanan, who were also inside the Ghost, noticed the darkness coming from it, and Ezra, who was in the gunner's position, told them that he felt a coldness coming from the ship. As Kanan and Ahsoka put their hands out the field to the Force, Ahsoka realized that her master had secretly lived. Vader knew the fight here was lost, and he rolled away from the number of blaster shots from the Ghost before being clipped again and jumping the hyperspace. At the same time, other Imperial vessels were ripped apart. The tactical droid told General Sandula that they would begin the landing procedure. This was more stressful for Hera, Ahsoka, and Kanan than it was for the space battle. They hadn't seen these droids in the field since the Clone Wars, so they didn't want to see them fight against the civilians. But as the ghost flew down, the battle droids were giving the landed procedure. Droidicas and B2 battle droids exclusively. The super tactical droid watched on a hollow map from space as units descended into the city. Stormtroopers may have been considered elite to the Imperial troopers, but they were no match for the demon droids known as B2s. A number of ATDPs walked out of the Imperial hangars and they began targeting the droids. There were a number of stormtroopers already wiped out, and the ghost did a flyby cutting out a couple of ATDPs. Though the survivors were unlucky. A real shame they never were warned about the wrist rockets. It didn't take much longer until the droids captured a command post. The droidicas were an absolute nightmare for the Imperial troops, but so were the B2s. As the ghost flew over, the people on the ground showed obvious fear. But the droids packed up and prepared to abandon the city, free from Imperial rain. Hera pulled the ship down and into the streets, and the people who watched the ship watched the ghost exit with smiles on their faces, expressing that they had liberated them from the Empire. The message that Ezra shared with the galaxy not long beforehand still sat present in their minds. Ezra may have been a little older than he was when he sent the message out, but the people came together in a glorious applause. They were free from the Empire. As the Alliance fleet prepared itself to leave, they reported back to Yavin about their victory. The victory was short-lived. A fleet that was in the area dropped out of hyperspace. The fleet wasn't nearly as large as the one that was already here. It was actually a combination of a couple fleets in the area. There were 8 Imperial 2 Star Destroyers and 5 Imperial 1 Star Destroyers, plenty of light cruisers and support ships as well. Of course, one of those Imperial 1s was a modified destroyer under the helm of Admiral Thrawn. He hadn't yet achieved the rank of Grand Admiral yet, but he was here to do the bidding of his Emperor. He stood at the helm of his bridge and commanded the ships forward. While he may have never had reason to believe he'd face the likes of the Separatists, he knew just about all their battle tactics. He studied them to improve his own skill, though he was much more familiar with rebel tactics, and he assumed that the one thing would be true. The Alliance fleet would dispatch their fighters first, and they'd be able to outnumber the Imperial pilots, so he had to counter that. Thrawn moved all of his light cruisers to the front of the line, which made them vulnerable to the attack of the Separatist fleet. A necessary sacrifice. Tactical droids were programmed to win, and he knew that when it came to a droid, they would always follow their programming. It's what made them weak adversaries. Though there was one thing that Thrawn couldn't possibly predict, which were the skills of the Twi'lek general, Harris and Dula. Thrawn didn't even know they were here. 
Vader just told the Emperor about the attack and he sent Thrawn to clean up the mess. Truthfully, Thrawn expected a massive battle with the last strain of the Confederacy, but the large rebel symbols painted across the side of the Separatist battleships told him differently. Thrawn also knew it to be unlikely that the Alliance could fill all these vessels with the necessary troops, so the chances that these ships were being maintained by the Separatists, battle droids, was much more likely. Thrawn watched the horde of fighters swarm forward and he told all TIE fighters to release. The captains tried to feud with him, but he wasn't having any of it. They needed to do it or else they would sacrifice the battle. Truthfully, these other officers thought that Thrawn had already sacrificed the battle. He was being far too aggressive and defensive at the same time. It made no sense to hold the Star Destroyers in reserve. The droid forces cruised forward and then Thrawn caught the sight of something peculiar. It was a wing of rebel ships. How fascinating. He hadn't accounted for them. There was also no ace fighter in his own fleet, so again they were outmatched by superior fighting force. Though this time, it was skill more than numbers. Thrawn was prepared and then he allowed the enemy to close in. The light cruisers immediately took a number of hits from the Separatist forces, but the TIE fighters and vulture droids engaged with each other. The fight intensified and Thrawn stood on his bridge with an eager smile as he awaited each result. He could see each fighter drop from his side, accompanied by the success of the vulture droids. He turned to his deckhand and told them to open fire on the Alliance fleet. The Star Destroyers were finally in range, and to top it all off, so were the Alliance fighter craft. While turbo lasers would have an extremely difficult time targeting these fighters from a distance, with them being as close as they were, it was just as easy as anyone could imagine. Just a stray shot could hit one or another. The intention was to aim for the larger vessels of the Alliance fleet and clip the vulture droids in the process. Hera led her forces forward and the Alliance fleet got into range. It was clear immediately, no one had the firepower of an Imperial Star Destroyer. That was well determined long before the battle, but Thrawn was impressed with the skill displayed by the fleet he was up against. The Alliance flagships packed a punch, but then Thrawn spotted something he was quite unfamiliar with. A bomber variant with an extreme array of power. It looked like he had a massive X, but it launched bombs with such precision. Only now in the moment did he realize the failure of the Empire and the success of the Alliance. What was needed was a bomber of extreme magnitudes. Thrawn watched the first Imperial Star Destroyer crumble. He knew he wouldn't come out on top of this one, but he could damage the Alliance fleet. The Empire had infinite resources, whereas this puny rebellion would only be wasting their only resources to maintain this battle. The thaw wasn't the prize to Thrawn, experience was. He got that, and so he might as well make good use of his time here. He told the ships to all target the same enemy vessel. They watched the shields melt from the ship and then shortly after, the vessel explode. He then gave another target to fire at as another couple Star Destroyers lost their shields. The Vulture Droids were given the command to do one thing, Kamikaze. One Vulture Droid could obliterate the bridge of a Star Destroyer. So instead of trying to go toe to toe with Thrawn, the Rebels went for as much as they could to try and deplete their numbers. Of course, they knew the truth about the size of the fleet. Thrawn had no reason to assume the Rebels had come up with such a sizable fleet this early into the Rebellion's life. The Alliance at this point in the battle was matching the Empire beat for beat. Hera kept putting pressure on the Chimera, but the bombers weren't able to get to her, mostly because of the light cruiser strategy. Plus, it was much easier to target the ships on the exterior of the flank rather than Thrawn in the middle. Thrawn requested to have contact with General Syndulla, and he was put through. An Imperial II next to the Chimera exploded and rocked the ship, but he was unwavering as he told Hera that she won this match. Her fleet was impressive, and the work they did was quite magnificent. But he had everything he needed from their little tango here over Lothal. He smiled and told her that he looked forward to the next engagement, whenever he might have the honor of facing her head on again. The communication cut and Thrawn ordered a full-on retreat from the battlefield. Hera ordered an attack and the bombers moved in. They were able to strand one Star Destroyer before the rest of the Imperial fleet limped away. The singular Star Destroyer that was stranded imploded from the inside out, which was not the plan, but for Chopper it was. Anyways, the Alliance won. As the Alliance returned to the Oven from Lothal, Hera informed the Council of the battle and how it went. As it turned out, the formerly Separatist fleet would be of great assistance to their efforts, though most of the fleet did not return from Lothal, being destroyed in the process. However, they needed to prepare for Thrawn. He would not go easy the next time they had an engagement. The super tactical droid that was present at the battle, otherwise known as Blitz, concluded that Thrawn was able to outmatch his own tactics without ever having fought against them. Blitz told the council that he would like to request a commando raid on an Imperial informational citadel. The Alliance was skeptical about it, but Hera agreed. She was willing to join the commando squad. Thrawn wasn't just an Imperial officer. He was a strategist, and he would be much more of a foe, and he would be back for more. The raid was granted and the Alliance would make a move on the Citadel at Scarif. While the facility was more of a technological institute, it would still have all the information in the Imperial database. Plus, it was far more removed from the rest of the Empire that if the Rebels needed evacuation, then a fleet could get there logistically to support them. The Ghost crew, Ahsoka, Captain Rex, and a number of commando droids would escort them. 
Of course, for Rex, this wasn't the most fun encounter ever. Having seen many of his brothers killed by commando droids in the war, he hated it. But Rex, just like Kanan and Ahsoka, saw that these droids could be used to help the galaxy, and that their time for rivalry should be put behind them for the time being. Though Rex had to appreciate the efficiency of the commando droids, because they were absolute monsters. He just liked to imagine that the Clone Wars would have gone with the Jedi, clones, and a couple commando droids, because this group that stormed the Citadel Tower in Scarif was quick and effective. Ezra was still young, but he was already showing signs of amazing potential. When the Ghost crew got to the top of the tower of the Citadel, Chopper plugged in and raided the entire hard drive. It was all going brilliantly until a number of troopers found them out. The Citadel turned into a firefight, but the commando droids worked in tandem with the Jedi as they ran through the Imperial units with their vibro swords or lightsabers. For Rex and Kanan having a disagreement already, and both of them hating commando droids, or just the droids in general, they were actually really able to be successful on their mission together. Once the drives were emptied out and the chopper, the rebels made a break for it. One of the commando droids was piloting the Imperial shuttle they arrived in, and they got onto the shuttle and lifted off. Luckily for the ghost, chopper was a galaxy class war criminal, so before the people in space could be informed to shut down the shield gate, the entire citadel around the ground exploded, killing every single Imperial trooper, officer, and whatnot on the ground. With the information obtained regarding Thrawn and a number of other Imperial projects, the Alliance fleet moved out in great magnitude. Though there was one key thing they were unaware of being worked on, on Ferex. Thrawn decided to go back to the birthplace of the Alliance to build his TIE Defender in their backyard. To him, it was a perfect place. And while the Death Star was under construction, he didn't care for it. Plus, his hyperdrive wasn't fully complete. They were able to move it from Genosis to Scarif. The Ghost crew happened to miss it because it was on the far side of the planet during their little mission. An Alliance fleet would be sent to Scarif, one with Admiral Raddus and a couple manned Alliance craft. The tandem between Raddus and Blitz worked extremely well, being that they were able to successfully take down the small support fleet and destroy the super weapon all in one go. Shortly after the Battle of Scarif, the architect of the Alliance's greatest asset passed away of a natural death, and a funeral would be held on Yavin 4 for Gizor Delso for his contribution to the wider galaxy. As it became clear to the wider galaxy, war was brewing on the horizon. Thrawn was able to finish his product and get it approved on Ferrix. He had no interest in taking his time with the design. The Empire needed a legitimate counter to the Alliance. The power of the Alliance fleet rallied support from systems across the galaxy, but the most important one was Mon Calamari where some of the best shipbuilders in the galaxy existed. Thrawn had no intention of allowing the Empire to crumble, and he would not allow it to crumble to the algorithm-driven battle droids from a war nearly 20 years old. Within days, the TIE Defender was rolled off the assembly lines at Kuat, Corellia, and Coruscant before being dispatched out to Imperial garrisons for their first show of action. The Alliance fighters would be caught off guard by the power of the TIE Defenders. Their shields were too powerful for most fighters aside from bombs from hyena bombers or Y-wings. However, both bombers were far too slow to catch up with them. The battle between the TIE Defender and the Alliance was on. As the war started to intensify with skirmishes turning into full-fledged battles, Thrawn prepared to wipe out the resistance with his new fleet, thanks to his Emperor. As newly appointed Grand Admiral Thrawn, he had every intention to wipe the Alliance in the galaxy. As he waited outside Ferrix, he prepared a great defense of the planet. He set up some Golan platforms and waited. The Seventh Fleet was much larger than the one he used at Lethal, equipped with 11 Imperial Ones, 20 Imperial Twos, and 6 Victory Class Star Destroyers, which were equipped with long-range missiles. Hera and Raddus knew it was a trap, as did the tactical droids who studied every move Thrawn made in his life. While Thrawn was one to assume the Alliance was searching for Imperial plans inside a Scarif, he knew that all of his transcripts and data were inside the Imperial databases in the Citadel, so the plans would likely be different from anything else he'd ever done here at Ferrix. The Seventh Fleet was one of the largest fleets in the Imperial Navy, and with Thrawn at the helm, they were ready. Because Thrawn wanted to play on his turf, he had a hypervelocity cannon constructed on the surface of Ferrix, just as a moral boost to the Imperial troopers on the ground. It was built right outside the square where the Rebellion was apparently born. The edge of the structure sat gently next to Marva Karassi Andor's brick. The thought of her lying there eternally next to the weapon that would destroy the people she inspired her just made it all the more enjoyable to Thrawn. The layout of the fleet wasn't typical, though there was something he hadn't accounted for, which was the addition of the Mon Calamari fleet. Admiral Raddus and General Sandula were accompanied by one of Mon Calamari's greatest leaders, Admiral Akbar. With the super tactical droids, they devised their plan of attack and moved in. Thrawn waited eagerly for the attack to come, and then the day came. The fleet exited hyperspace, and Thrawn ordered all TIE fighters out of the hangar bays. He then directed a counter-assault of TIE defenders launched from the surface of the planet. The Golan platforms at the outer edge of the planet's gravitational field soaked up all the damage of the rebel fighters, as everything came to fruition as Thrawn planned. 
This may have not been Coruscant, but it was one of the few strongholds this far out in the galaxy. Thrawn knew if he won, that he would rid the galaxy of the Alliance forever. However, he didn't know what would happen if he failed, which is why he didn't plan for it. He looked at the Order Lucrahawks at the front of the Alliance line, and then found this to be particularly odd. Why were they sacrificing their carriers this early on? Not that Luker Hawks didn't pack a punch, it's just that it didn't make any sense. He told the fleet to hold position, but opened fire. As he did, another fleet dropped out of hyperspace. How interesting. It was an Alliance fleet with more heavy hitters. Thrawn then spotted something crawling over the back of the Luker Hawks. It was Home 1. Thrawn knew of Akbar from the Clone Wars. He never thought he'd actually join the Alliance. What a pity. Without wasting a breath, he told the hypervelocity cannon on the ground to fire, and it didn't. The blast ripped through one of the Luka Hawks and it exploded. Thrawn looked to the right of his flank where the second part of the Rebel fleet was. He found it weird that they would divide the fleet up in the way they had, but he would take advantage of it. The held and reserve TIE defenders would deal with the right side of the flank. General Sindula figured that Thrawn would have something up his sleeve, and so did she. From the Alliance lines came a bundle of HMP gunships. Attached to the bottom were lifeless B2s waiting for their deployment. Hera broke off with a group of A-Wings, X-Wings, Y-Wings, and B-Wings, and cruised forward, avoiding Flak as the TIE Fighters moved in. To counter them, Blitz sent in a wave of Vulture Droids to cover their approach. The fighter fight started and Thrawn got antsy. He lived for this. He turned to the deckhands and told them to order all six victories to open fire. The missile bays on the victory class star destroyers opened fire. The battlefield became an array of terror, though the victories were not exactly accurate, which meant TIE Fighters would get in the way and they would be killed. A necessary sacrifice. The plan was to take down as many fighters as possible so the Alliance couldn't hold off the TIE defenders, though Thrawn noticed that there was something missing. Where was the CIS bombers? Out from hyperspace, the third fleet deployed on the left side of the fleet. How uncharacteristic. Thrawn ordered the hypervelocity cannon to fire whenever it was ready and continued doing so until the battle was won. Another Luka Hulk was hit by the blast, as the tactical droids communicated with Radis and Akbar about their plans, though they persisted that continuing forward would guarantee the best results. The rebels behind the ghosts continued to cruise forward until they were met with resistance from the TIE defenders coming from the ground. The ghosts gave out orders for the evasive action, as gunner turrets opened fire and torpedoes were launched in all sorts of directions. The HMPs dropped their B-2 battle droids, though they were the flying variants so they latched onto the TIE defenders, and they scared the pilots literally to death as they ripped open the cockpit and watched the pilots get sucked into the cold abyss of space. The rebels continued forward and some old troop transports from the Trade Federation launched into the fray. It was a massacre for the droid forces, but it was working. The tactical droids had one objective, victory, so they pressed forward. One of them got bold and sent in a Requiem pincer cruiser as they opened an array of missile back at the Victory 2s, which had been bombarding the Alliance. The tactic worked and the missiles clipped the Victory's cannons, overloading the systems and detonating the vessels. Out from one of the Rebel hangar bays, a grouping of U-Wings lifted up and out as it descended down to the surface, following Hera. With the path being cleared by the Rebel fighters and the Ghost, the Rebels and droids were able to get their troops onto the ground. The Trade Federation dropships planted down inside the city, and the B-1s filled the streets. There was a genuine sizable garrison on the planet being led by Governor Price, as per the request of Thrawn. She would have gone to Lothal if it wasn't for the loss of the battle before. As the Imperial Stormtroopers responded to the B-1s, they realized that they weren't cut out to be clones. Over the years, there were so many debates over who was better, but it had never been clear until this moment. On the other side of the city, Captain Andor led a group of rebels alongside Captain Rex and a number of B2s and assorted battle droids. The battle in the streets was intense, but the Alliance forces were ripping through the stormtroopers. When it came to droidicas, there was no competition. The stormtroopers were no match. They deployed a couple of ATSTs, but as the rebels liked to call them, chicken walkers were no match for the Alliance. In space, Thrawn was getting agitated. His fleet was performing well, but not well enough. A wing of B-Wings flew over the back of his ship and detonated the shield generators. Thrawn was pissed, but not as much as he was when he looked down at the hull of the ship and demanded to know why there were battle droids on the hull. They weren't just any battle droids, they were the same ones Grievous used to destroy the Coruscant power grid during the Clone War. The droids locked down into the hull of the Chimera and exploded, ripping through the hull of the ship. There were enough of them that the entire bridge was launched forward and the entire ship ripped in half. Thrawn woke up moments later, looking at the debris of his ship. It was in shambles. One of his troopers helped him up and told him that there was a ship that they could get into and relocate to. Thrawn got to his feet and started forward. Admiral Akbar and Radis pushed the Mon Calamari cruisers forward, but the bulk of the fleet was already doing that. The sacrificed Lucrahawks were drifting away, and the Star Destroyers were crushing through the Alliance support craft. But that's why they were there. The Providences were standing strong, and that's all that legitimately mattered for the leaders of the battle. The Imperial 1s and 2s were starting to struggle, with the hypervelocity cannon still firing into the sky, they still had a hope of pulling this one off. 
the Ghosts and a number of Alliance vessels came back around. They were leading the countering defenders away from the surface. In space, the Imperials seemed to get their first break as the TIE defenders were able to defeat the waves of Vulture droids. A singular wave was able to get through the battle. Of course, the Alliance was able to keep sending waves of Vulture droids, but this wing of defenders was free. They sped forward and climbed up the front of one of the Providences and blew all to hell, destroying one of the tactical droids in the process. Being that the other Imperial officers assumed Thrawn was killed, they began to give each other contradictory orders, which displaced the entire fleet even more. The fighter superiority was starting to check in for the Empire, and the battle that seemed so lost was no longer seemingly lost. Thrawn entered one of the still standing Imperial twos and quickly ushered himself to the bridge and took command of the battlefront. On the ground, the rebels and droids were finally together as they began cutting through the Empire. Ander and his squad of rebels came up to the side of the hypervelocity cannon and saw where it was. Because of the weight of the cannon, whenever it fired, it vibrated outwards, which meant that his adopted mother's brick was shattered. Ander couldn't help but think that Marv would be so proud of this little rebellion. They ran into the base, commando droids using their vibro blades to cut down the stormtroopers as the rebels planted the bombs. The weapon was emptied and the Alliance forces retreated from the massive weapon, getting into their landing craft and taking off. As the weapon fired again, and imploded in on self. The stray blast slammed into the back of an Imperial Star Destroyer. With the ground forces safe, Hera had to make sure they could get back to the landing base safely. Thrawn looked out and he could see that the ghost was coming back up, and he assumed that the rebels had destroyed the hypervelocity cannon on the surface, especially since the misfire. He wanted nothing more than the beat Syndulla on the battlefield. With Home 1 coming around for a broadside, he didn't have time to try and counter Syndulla. Had it been the Chimera, he would have faded better, but the Imperial 2 he was in was already badly damaged across the hull thanks to some loose B-wings that carved out some gouges in the hull. With Home 1 giving it her all, Thrawn looked on in a massive sense of congratulations, a foe that had finally bested him in combat. What a shame their dance couldn't be continued onto another front, as the Imperial 2 detonated killing all the crew inside. The rest of the Imperial forces began to rout but it was far too late. They were mostly destroyed before they could get the jump to hyperspace. The Alliance had won the day. General Sandula would meet with Admiral Akbar and they would discuss their plans going forward. With the war heating up and additions of Luke Skywalker and Ben Kenobi, it seemed like the Rebellion had a real chance at destroying the Empire. By the time Skywalker was piloting Red 5, the Alliance was making his push into Coruscant. Of course, the Empire wouldn't dare concede to a lesser foe, but with so many losses or draws, their days were numbered. Lord Vader was with his master on Coruscant when the Alliance came. They didn't want to fight, but the Empire did. The fight was dragged down to the atmosphere of the planet. This was planned by Sidious. He knew he could deal with the Alliance fleet himself. So as the Alliance descended into the city to defeat the retreating Imperial forces in the Second Battle of Coruscant, Sidious asked his student to see what could have been if he had not lost to Kenobi on Mustafar. Another brilliant dig, by the luckiest Sith the galaxy had ever seen. He stood outside the Senate building and reached his hands into the sky and filled the sky with electricity. Every single ship in the air lost control, and they all fell to the surface. The Empire was able to fight back. For a lot of civilians, this meant they were almost crushed or absolutely crushed by Sidious. The Dark Lord laughed as he watched the last of the Alliance fall to their deaths. The super tactical droid, who served with Geyser the longest, tried to maintain control of his flagship, but it slammed into the Senate building. Both Vader and Sidious were so preoccupied by everything else that they didn't sense it until they were crushed by it. Red Phi was able to pull up and join the Ghost, as she and the rest of the Alliance forced the Empire to surrender. The war came to an end, but the politics of the war did not. Aside from a warship where the Senate used to be, the Empire had a big issue with the formerly Separatist battle droids being used against them in a war. Though, as it was explained by Bale and Mon, that they were actively using them so they could restore democracy. The dictatorship of the Emperor ruined the galaxy, and it was promised that the battle droids would be reprogrammed and turned into droids to help people, not hurt them. There was absolutely no need to have such a large fleet or army when there was no opponent but that wouldn't come soon. Imperial remnants trying to turn Operation Cinder and so forth on would be ousted themselves. Project Necromancer died before it could ever get off the ground, being that the Emperor died before ever being able to essence transfer out before being crushed by the battleship. The animosity towards the Alliance would be very challenging after the Empire was defeated, but truthfully by this point Palpatine had worn out his welcome. The galaxy was ready for change and once it became abundantly clear that the Alliance wanted nothing but the best for the galaxy, people rallied. Imperial Remnant factions wouldn't be able to stand up against the might of the Alliance. With battleships from Mon Calamari coming off the assembly lines, it was clear that the droid armies were no longer needed, though they were needed for other things, such as maintaining the balance. They wouldn't just throw the droids away and act like they didn't exist. They liberated the galaxy. Over the years, the Alliance would be able to retire the fleet after the Battle of Jakku, where the remaining Imperial Remnant went to die. The battle finished off the Galactic Civil War with a bang and the New Republic was heralded in as a new leaders of peace and justice. 
Ben Kenobi would take Luke on a journey on the Force, and it would lead to an academy of new Jedi, one overseen by Master Kenobi. Leia would continue to serve inside the New Republic alongside her father, and while she learned about Anakin, as far as she was concerned, she would always be Nargana. Mon Mothma would be appointed to the role of Chancellor of the New Republic, with Gideon, Hux, and the other officers of the Remnant dispatched before and after the Battle of Jakku, the rule of the Empire could be left behind as the galaxy ushered in a new era of peace. And that, my friends, is our story. Again, special thanks to our grand tier for suggesting this video, and also thanks to our other patrons, Galavan Gaming, Tristan, Darth Revan, Pimp Daddy Bane, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Wee Woo 670, Ozzy Tano, Darth Knox, The Eternal Padawan, Johnny Nguyen, Sans the Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Lord Kallik, Youngling Slayer 66, Mad Men Studios, Anakin 003, Forda's Legacy, Star Wars, Lemon Knight, Rex the Wolf, The Man with Three First Names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. Smash that like button on this epic video! Uh, if you want to see me mispronounce names again and see other things like updates on the Sith Clone Wars, which is coming soon, I just finished two episodes the other day, uh, go check out the Patreon. Patreon has all the updates, it's super cool. Plus, if you're like Mr. Pimp Daddy Bane, you can uh, request a video like this. Anyways, let's talk about our story. The one thing that I had on my goal in this video, obviously aside from Geyser, was, was mentioning every single battle droid, at least trying to mention every battle droid, uh, that we've seen in the Clone Wars and other media. And so that was really like, I was really, really, really wanted to put them in here because I wanted it to feel like, like the entire Alliance was utilizing what they could because the, the Alliance is scrappy, right? And so, like, that's the one thing that I really kind of had a challenge with was showing the scrappiness of the Alliance, but showing, like, how the head-on, like, how the Separatists could do a head-on assault against the the Empire. And this is, like, a, a grand-scale thing. And the main opponent I wanted to be thrown. I didn't really care about the whole Sith thing. That, you know, that wasn't the main uh, objective of this. The main objective was to have an actual fleet battle and have, like, logistics and stuff like that. And so it was fun doing that. Uh, having Thrawn basically lose to battles in a row is, like, super-duper rare. But I'm literally suggesting that the Separatists had such overwhelming forces and that it was more or less a draw at Lothal and then obviously the battle at Ferris was a loss. Anyways, hope you all enjoyed this video. Super fun, super duper different, just kind of fun working in between the era of the prequels and the OT. Anyways, I hope you all enjoyed. I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the Force be with you.